Matilda by Roald Dahl, adapted by Edward Kelsey. It's a funny thing about mothers and fathers. Even when their own child is the most disgusting little blister you could imagine, they still think that he or she is wonderful. But occasionally, one comes across parents who take the opposite line. And these, of course, are far worse than the doting ones. Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were two such parents. They had a son called Michael and a daughter called Matilda. The parents looked upon Matilda as nothing more than a scab and looked forward enormously to the time when they could pick their little daughter off and flick her away, preferably into the next county. It's bad enough when the parents treat ordinary children as though they were scabs and bunions, but it becomes somehow a lot worse when the child in question is extraordinary. Matilda was brilliant. Her mind was so nimble and she was so quick to learn that her ability should have been obvious to the most half-witted of parents. But Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were so gauntless and so wrapped up in their own silly lives that they failed to notice anything unusual about their daughter. By the age of one and a half, her speech was perfect and she knew as many words as most grown-ups. The parents, instead of applauding her, called her a noisy chatterbox. By the time she was three, Matilda had taught herself to read by studying newspapers and magazines that lay around the house. At the age of four, she could read fast and well and began hankering after books. The only book in the house was something called Easy Cooking. And when she had read this from cover to cover, she decided she wanted something more interesting. She asked her father. Buy me a book. A book? What do you want a flaming book for? To read, Daddy. What's wrong with a telly, for heaven's sake? You've got a lovely telly with a 12-inch screen, and now you come asking for a book. You're getting spoiled, my girl. Nearly every weekday afternoon, Matilda was left alone in the house. Her brother, five years older than her, went to school. Her father went to work and her mother went out playing bingo in a town eight miles away. On the afternoon of the day that her father refused to buy her a book, Matilda set out all by herself to the public library in the village. Mrs. Phelps, the librarian, was very surprised to see such a tiny girl unaccompanied by a parent, and even more surprised when she found out how well she could read. She soon finished reading all the books in the children's section, and over the next six months, Mrs. Phelps introduced her to many books for grown-ups, written by famous authors like Charles Dickens and Charlotte Bronte, Jane Austen and Thomas Hardy, George Orwell and Ernest Hemingway. Mr. Hemingway says a lot of things I don't understand, Mrs. Phelps, but I loved it all the same. The way he tells it, I feel I am right there, on the spot, watching it all happen. A fine writer will always make you feel that. And don't worry about the bits you can't understand. Sit back and allow the words to wash around you like music. Did you know, Matilda, that public libraries like this allow you to borrow books and take them home? From then on, Matilda would visit the library only once a week to take out new books and return the old ones. Her own small bedroom now became her reading room. Matilda's parents owned quite a nice house. Her father was a dealer in second-hand cars, and he was very proud of how well he did at it. Sawdust is one of the great secrets of my success, and it costs me nothing. What do you use it for, Daddy? Ah, wouldn't you like to know? I don't see how sawdust can help you sell second-hand cars. That's because you're an ignorant little twit. You must be very clever to find a use for something that costs nothing. I wish I could do it. Well, you couldn't. You're too stupid. 
but I don't mind telling young Mike here about it, seeing he'll be joining me in the business one day. I'm always glad to buy a car when some fool has worn out the gears and they rattle like mad, I'll get it cheap. Then all I do is mix a lot of sawdust with the oil in the gearbox and it runs as sweet as a nut. How long will it run like that before it starts rattling again? Long enough for the buyer to get a good distance away. But that's dishonest, Daddy. It's cheating. No one ever got rich being honest. If you don't like it, then don't eat the food in this house. It's bought with the profits. It's dirty money. I hate it. Who do you think you are? You're just an ignorant little squirt who hasn't the foggiest idea what you're talking about. You've got a nerve talking to your father like that. Now keep your nasty mouth shut so we can all watch this programme in peace. Mrs Wormwood sat munching her meal with her eyes glued to the American soap opera on the screen. She was a large woman with her hair dyed platinum blonde, except where you could see the mousy brown bits growing out from the roots. She wore heavy makeup, and she had one of those unfortunate bulging figures where the flesh appears to be strapped in to prevent it falling out. Matilda did not enjoy watching the television. Mummy, would you mind if I ate my supper in the dining room so I could read my book? I would mind. Supper is a family gathering and no one leaves the table until it's over. But we're not at the table. We never are. We're always eating off our knees and watching the telly. What's wrong with watching the telly, may I ask? Matilda didn't trust herself to answer him, so she kept quiet. She could feel the anger boiling up inside her. She knew it was wrong to hate her parents like this, but she was finding it very hard not to do so. She resented being told constantly that she was ignorant and stupid when she knew she wasn't. As she lay in bed that night, she made a decision. She decided that every time her father or her mother was beastly to her, she would get her own back in some way or other. You must remember that she was still hardly five years old, and it's not easy for somebody as small as that to score points against an all-powerful grown-up. Even so, she was determined to have a go. And after what had happened in front of the telly this evening, Daddy is first on my list. The following morning, just before the father left for his beastly second-hand car garage, Matilda slipped into the cloakroom and got hold of the hat he wore each day to work. She squeezed a line of super glue very neatly all around the inside rim of the hat. She timed this operation very carefully, applying the glue just as her father was getting up from the table. He didn't notice anything when he put the hat on, but when he arrived at the garage, he couldn't get it off. He had to keep it on all day, even when putting sawdust in gearboxes and fiddling the mileages on the speedometers. When he got home that evening, he still couldn't get the hat off. His wife laughed. <laughs> Don't be silly, Harry. Come here. I'll take it off for you. Ow! Don't do that. Let go. You'll take half the skin off me forehead. What's the matter, Daddy? Has your head suddenly swollen or something? It must be super glue. It couldn't be anything else. I haven't touched the flaming stuff. You should read the label on the tube before you start messing with dangerous products. What in heaven's name are you talking about, you stupid witch? Do you think I'm so stupid I'd glue this thing to me head on purpose? There's a boy down the road who got some super glue on his finger without knowing it. The finger got stuck inside his nose and he had to go around like that for a week. People kept saying to him, stop picking your nose, and he couldn't do anything about it. Serve him right. He shouldn't have put his finger up there in the first place. It's a nasty habit. If all children had super glue put on their fingers, they'd soon stop doing it. Grown-ups do it too, Mummy. I saw you doing it yesterday in the kitchen. That's quite enough from you. How am I going to have me shower? You'll just have to do without it, won't you? And how am I going to get to sleep? Now do stop fussing around. I expect it'll be loose by the morning and then it'll slip off easily. But it wasn't loose by the morning and it didn't slip off. So Mrs Wormwood took a pair of scissors and cut the thing off his head, bit by bit. Where the inner band had stuck to the hair all round the sides and back, she had to chop the hair off right back to the skin so that he finished up with a bald white ring round his head. And in the front, where the band had stuck directly to the bare skin, there remained a whole lot of small patches of brown leathery stuff that no amount of washing would get off. You must 
try to get those bits off your forehead, Daddy. It looks as though you've got little brown insects crawling about all over you. People will think you've got lice. Be quiet. Just keep your nasty mouth shut, will you? There was comparative calm in the Wormwood household for about a week after the superglue episode. The experience had clearly chastened Mr. Wormwood, and he seemed temporarily to have lost his taste for boasting and bullying. Then, suddenly, he struck again. Perhaps he'd had a bad day at the garage and had not sold enough crummy second-hand cars. When Mr. Wormwood arrived back from the garage that evening, his face was as dark as a thundercloud. He strode into the living room. Matilda happened to be curled up in an armchair in the corner, totally absorbed in a book. Mr. Wormwood switched on the television and glared at Matilda. Don't you ever stop reading? Oh, hello, Daddy. Did you have a good day? Get that book here. What is this trash? It isn't trash, Daddy. It's lovely. It's called The Red Pony. It's by John Steinbeck, an American writer. Why don't you try it? You'll love it. Filth! If it's by an American, it's certain to be filth. That's all they write about. I'm fed up with your reading anyway. There! That's what I think of this American trash. There! And there! And there! Daddy, don't tear it up. It's a library book. It doesn't belong to me. I have to return it to Mrs. Phelps. Then you'll have to buy another one, won't you? You'll have to save your pocket money until there's enough in the kitty to buy a new one for your precious Mrs. Phelps, won't you? <laughs> he dropped the now empty covers of the book into the waste paper basket and marched out of the room. Most children in Matilda's place would have burst into floods of tears. She didn't do this. Her wonderfully subtle mind was already at work, devising yet another suitable punishment for the poisonous parent. Matilda had a friend called Fred. He was a small boy of six who lived just around the corner from her, and for days he'd been going on about this great talking parrot his father had given him. So the following afternoon, as soon as Mrs. Wormwood had departed for another session of bingo, Matilda set out for Fred's house. Hello, Fred! Would you be kind enough to show me your famous parrot? Of course. There it is. Its name is Chopper. Make it talk. You can't make it talk. You have to be patient. It'll talk when it feels like it. Hello, hello, hello. That's amazing. Rock on my bones. Rock on my bones. Hello, hello, hello. He's always saying that. What else can he say? That's about it. But it's pretty marvellous, don't you think? It's fabulous. Will you lend him to me just for one night? No, certainly not. I'll give you all my next week's pocket money. All right, then. If you promise to return him tomorrow. Matilda staggered back to her own empty house, carrying the magnificent blue and yellow parrot in its tall cage. There was a large fireplace in the dining room, and she now set about wedging the cage up the chimney and out of sight. That evening, while the mother, the father, the brother and Matilda were having supper as usual in the living room in front of the television, a voice came loud and clear from the dining room across the hall. Right then, in we go. Hello, hello, hello. Harry! There's someone in the house. I heard a voice. Hello, hello, hello. It's burglars. They're in the dining room. Yeah, I think they are. Then go and catch them, Harry. Go out and collar them red-handed. Well, uh, uh, Get on with it. They're probably after the silver. <coughs> Why don't we all go together? They're definitely in the dining room. I'm sure they are. The mother grabbed a poker from the fireplace. The father took a golf club that was standing in the corner. The brother seized a table lamp. Matilda took the knife she'd been eating with and all four of them crept towards the dining room door, the father keeping well behind the others. Come on, stick them up. We've caught you. <laughs> There's no one here. I heard him, Harry. I distinctly heard his voice. So did you. I'm certain I heard him. He's in here somewhere. Oh! oh. I know it's a ghost. I've heard it here before. This room is haunted. I thought you knew that. Oh, save us! I'm getting out of here. They all fled, slamming the door behind them.
The next afternoon, Matilda took a rather sooty and grumpy parrot back to Fred's house. Did it behave itself? We had a lovely time with it, Fred. My parents adored it. Matilda longed for her parents to be good and loving and understanding and honourable and intelligent. The fact that they were none of these things was something she had to put up with. Being very small and very young, the only power Matilda had over anyone in her family was brain power. For sheer cleverness, she could run rings around them all. But the fact remained that any five-year-old girl in any family was always obliged to do as she was told, however asinine the orders might be. The thing that prevented her from going round the bend was the fun of devising and dishing out these splendid punishments. The parrot in the chimney affair quite definitely cooled both parents down quite a lot, and for over a week they were comparatively civil to their small daughter. But alas, this couldn't last. One evening, Mr. Wormwood came home very pleased with himself. He rubbed his hands together and addressed his son. Your father's had a most successful day. Uh, listen, boy, seeing as you'll be going into this business with me one day, you've got to know how to add up the profits. I've got them all here on this bit of paper. Now, I'll read them out to you, and you write them down and add them up. Ready? Yes, Dad. Right. Car number one was bought by me for £278 and sold for £1,425. Right? Car number two cost me £118 and sold for £760. Car number three cost £111 and sold for £999.50. Say that again, Dad. How much did it sell for? £999.50. And, and that, by the way, is another of my nifty little tricks to diddle the customer. Never ask for a big round figure. Always go just below it. Never say £1,000. Always say £999.50. It sounds much less, but it isn't. You're brilliant, Dad. Now, <clears throat> car number four cost £86. A real wreck that was, and sold for £699.50. Car number five cost £637 and sold for £1,649.50. That's a lot of sums. Of course it's a lot of sums. But when you're in big business, you've got to be hot stuff at arithmetic. I've practically got a computer inside my head. It took me less than ten minutes to work the whole thing out. You mean you did it in your head, Dad? <clears throat> well, not exactly. I mean, nobody could do that. When you're finished, tell me what you think my profit was for the day. I've got the final total written down here, and I'll tell you if you're right. Dad, you made exactly £4,303.50 altogether. Don't butt in, Matilda. Your brother and I are busy with high finance. But, Dad... Shut up! Stop guessing and try to be clever. Look at your answer, Dad. If you've done it right, it ought to be £4,303.50. Is that what you've got, Dad? I'm sure it's right. You little cheat! You looked at my bit of paper. Daddy, I'm on the other side of the room. How could I possibly see it? Don't give me that rubbish. Of course you looked. No one in the world could give the right answer just like that. Especially a girl. You're a little cheat, madam. That's what you are. Here we are, lovely fish and chips up from the fish and chip shop. Why are you looking so red in the face about Harry? Your daughter's a cheat and a liar. Turn the telly on. Let's not have any more talk. There was no doubt in Matilda's mind that this latest display of foulness by her father deserved severe punishment, and by the time she went up to bed, her mind was made up. Mr Wormwood had a fine crop of black hair, which he parted in the middle, and of which he was exceedingly proud. He kept his hair looking bright and strong, or so he thought, by rubbing into it every morning large quantities of a lotion called Oil of Violet's Hair Tonic. Now, in the early morning privacy of the bathroom, Matilda unscrewed the cap of her father's Oil of Violet's and tipped three quarters of the contents down the drain. Then she filled the bottle up with her mother's platinum blonde hair dye, extra strong. At breakfast time, Matilda sat quietly at the dining room table, eating her cornflakes. Mr Wormwood came noisily into the room. Uh, where's my breakfast? It's coming, Treasure. Here you are. Oh! 
<laughs> what the heck's the matter with you, woman? Throwing my breakfast all over the floor. Look at the mess you made on the carpet. Your hair. Look at your hair. What have you done to your hair? What's wrong with me hair, for heaven's sake? Oh, my God, Dad. What have you done to your hair? You've dyed it. Oh, why did you do it, you fool? It looks absolutely frightful. Oh, it looks horrendous. You look like someone's grandmother gone wrong. Yeah, give me a mirror. Don't just stand there shrieking at me. Give me a mirror. Here you are. Look at my compact mirror. <laughs> oh, don't spill the powder. Oh, my God. Oh, I look terrible. I, I look like you. Gone wrong. How could it have happened? I imagine, Daddy, that you weren't looking very hard and you simply took Mummy's bottle of hair stuff off the shelf instead of your own. Well, really, Harry, how stupid can you get? My stuff is terribly strong. I'm only meant to use one tablespoon of it and a whole basin of water. Oh. And you've got to put it all over your head neat. Oh. It'll probably take all your hair off in the end. Oh, well, what shall I do? Tell me quick what to do before it starts falling out. I'd give it a good wash, Dad, if I were you, with soap and water, but you'll have to hurry. Will that change the colour back? Of course it won't, you twit. You'll have to have it dyed black. All right, give me an appointment with your hairdresser this instant for an hair dyeing job. I'm going upstairs to wash it now. He does do some pretty silly things now and again, doesn't he, Mummy? Mm, I'm afraid men are not always quite as clever as they think they are. You'll learn that when you get a bit older, my girl. Matilda was a little late in starting school because her parents had forgotten to make the proper arrangements in advance. She was five and a half when she entered school for the first time. The village school for younger children was a bleak brick building called Cruncham Hall Primary School. The head teacher, the boss, the supreme commander of this establishment was a formidable middle-aged lady whose name was Miss Trunchbull. Naturally, Matilda was put in the bottom class where there were 18 other small boys and girls about the same age as her. Their teacher was called Miss Honey and she could not have been more than 23 or 24. Miss Jennifer Honey was a mild and quiet person who never raised her voice and was seldom seen to smile but there is no doubt she possessed that rare gift for being adored by every small child under her care. Miss Trunchbull, the headmistress, was something else altogether. She was a gigantic holy terror, a fierce, tyrannical monster who frightened the life out of the pupils and teachers alike. After the usual business of going through all the names of the children, Miss Honey handed out a brand new exercise book to each pupil. Now, this is the very first day of school for each one of you. It is the beginning of at least 11 long years of schooling that all of you are going to have to go through. And six of those years will be spent right here at Cruncham Hall, where, as you know, your headmistress is Miss Trunchbull. She insists upon strict discipline. And if you take my advice, you will do your very best to behave yourselves in her presence. If you get on the wrong side of Miss Trunchbull, she can liquidise you like a carrot in a kitchen blender. <laughs> it's nothing to laugh about, Lavender. All of you will be wise to remember that Miss Trunchbull deals very severely with anyone who gets out of line in this school. Uh, I myself want to help you to learn as much as possible while you're in this class. For example, by the end of this week, I shall expect every one of you to know the two times table by heart. Now then... Do any of you happen to have learnt the two times table already? Ah, Matilda. Wonderful. Please stand up and recite as much as you can. Twice one are two, twice two are four, twice three are six, twice four are... When Matilda got to twice twelve is twenty-four, she didn't stop. She went right on. Twice fifteen is thirty, twice sixteen Stop! How far can you go? I don't know, Miss Honey, for quite a long way, I think. You mean that you could tell me what two times twenty-eight is? Yes, Miss Honey. What is it? Fifty-six, Miss Honey. What about something much harder, like two times four hundred and eighty-seven? Nine hundred and seventy-four. <gasps> that really is splendid. 
But, of course, multiplying by two is a lot easier than some of the bigger numbers. What about the other multiplication tables? Do you know any of those? Yes, Miss Honey. What are twelve sevens? Eighty-four. I hope the rest of you are listening to this. Matilda is a very lucky girl. Was it your mother, Matilda, who taught you? No, Miss Honey, it wasn't. Ah, you must have a great father, then. He must be a brilliant teacher. No, Miss Honey. You mean you taught yourself? I don't know, Miss Honey. It's just that I don't find it very difficult to multiply one number by another. Tell me, Matilda, what exactly goes on in your head when you get a multiplication like that to do? I've always said to myself that if a little pocket calculator can do it, why shouldn't I? I'm afraid I don't know how else to explain it. Miss Honey was feeling quite quivery. There was no doubt in her mind that she had met a truly extraordinary mathematical brain. She could not resist the temptation of exploring still further the mind of this astonishing child. How much can you read, Matilda? I think I can read most things, Miss Honey, although I can't always understand the meanings. This is a book of humorous poetry. See if you can read this one aloud. An epicure dining at crew found a rather large mouse in his stew. Cried the waiter, don't shout, and wave it about, or the rest will be wanting one too. <laughs> Do you happen to know what that particular type of poetry is called? It's called a limerick. That's a lovely one. It's so funny. A witty limerick is very hard to write. They look easy, but they most certainly are not. I know. I've tried, but mine are never any good. Well, Matilda, I would very much like to hear one of these limericks you say you've written. Well, I've actually been trying to make up one about you, Miss Honey, but I've had to use your first name to make it rhyme, so I don't want to say it. Oh, I insist upon hearing this limerick. Stand up and recite it. The thing we all ask about Jenny is surely there cannot be many young girls in the place with so lovely a face. The answer to that is not any. Oh, why, thank you, Matilda. Although it is not true, it is really a very good limerick. Who taught you to read? I just sort of taught myself, Miss Honey. Have you read any books all by yourself? Any children's books, I mean. I've read all the ones that are in the public library. Now I'm reading the other books. What other books? I'm very fond of Charles Dickens. He makes me laugh a lot, especially Mr Pickwick. At that moment, the bell in the corridor sounded for the end of class. In the interval, Miss Honey left the classroom and headed straight for the headmistress's study. She felt wildly excited. She had just met a small girl who possessed quite extraordinary qualities of brilliance. It would be ridiculous to leave a child like that stuck in the bottom form. Normally, Miss Honey was terrified of the headmistress, but at this moment, she felt ready to take on anybody. Enter! Miss Honey went in. Now, most head teachers are chosen because they possess a number of fine qualities. They understand children, and they have the children's best interests at heart. They are sympathetic, they are fair, and they are deeply interested in education. Miss Trunchbull possessed none of these qualities. She had once been a famous athlete, and even now the muscles were still clearly in evidence. Looking at her, you got the feeling that this was someone who could bend iron bars and tear telephone directories in half. She had an obstinate chin, a cruel mouth, and small, arrogant eyes. And as for her clothes, she always had on a brown cotton smock, which was pinched in at the waist, with a wide leather belt. The massive thighs which emerged from out of the smock were encased in a pair of extraordinary breeches, bottle green in colour. These breeches reached to just below the knees, and from there on down, she sported green stockings with turn-up tops. On her feet, she wore flat-heeled brown brogues with leather flaps. She looked, in short, 
more like a bloodthirsty follower of the staghounds than the headmistress of a nice school for children. Yes, Miss Honey, what is it you want? Have those little stinkers been flicking spitballs at you? No, headmistress, nothing like that. Get on with it then, I'm a busy woman. There is a little girl in my class called Matilda Wormwood. Ah, that is the daughter of the man who owns Wormwood Motors. An excellent person, Wormwood. I was in there only yesterday. He sold me a car. A terrific bargain. Yes, I liked Wormwood. He told me the daughter's a bad lot, though. He said to watch her. He said if anything bad happened in the school, it was certain to be his daughter who did it. Oh, no, headmistress, that can't be right. Oh, yes, it darn well is right. In fact, I'll bet it was her who put that stink bong under my desk here first thing this morning. I shall have her for that, you see, if I don't. What's she like? Nasty little worm, I'll be bound. Squashing a bad girl is like trying to squash a blue bottle. You bang down on it, and the darn thing isn't there. Nasty, dirty things, little girls. Glad I never was one. Oh, but you must have been a little girl once, headmistress. Not for long, anyway. Now, what is it you want? Why are you wasting my time? I came to talk to you about Matilda. May I please tell you what happened in class just now? I suppose she set fire to your skirt and scorched your knickers. No, no. Matilda is a genius. A genius? What piffle is this you're talking, madam? I have her father's word for it, that the child's a gangster. She knows her tables past 12 times. She can multiply. So she's learnt a few tables by heart, had she? That doesn't make her a genius. It makes her a parrot. But she can read. So can I. It is my opinion that Matilda should be placed immediately in the top form with the 11-year-olds. Ah, so you want to get rid of her, do you? No, no. That uh, is not my reason at all. I can see right through your little plot, madam. Matilda stays where she is, and it's up to you to see that she behaves herself. But, headmistress... Not another word. Very well, then. It's up to you, headmistress. You're darn right it's up to me. And don't forget, madam, that we're dealing here with a little viper who put a stink bomb under my desk. She did not do that, headmistress. Of course she did it. I wish I was still allowed to use the birch and the belt as I did in the good old days. I'd have roasted Matilda's bottom for her so she couldn't sit down for a month. When Miss Honey emerged from the headmistress's study, most of the children were outside in the playground. She told herself, I'm going to do something about Matilda. I don't know what it will be, but I, I shall find a way to help her in the end. Her first move was to go round to the various teachers who taught the senior class and borrow from them a number of textbooks on algebra, geometry, French, English literature and the like. Then she called Matilda into the classroom. There is no point in your sitting in class doing nothing while I'm teaching the rest of the form the two times table and how to spell cat and rat and mouse. So, during each lesson, I shall give you one of these textbooks to study. At the end of the lesson, you can come up and I shall try to help you. Now, how does that sound? That sounds fine, Miss Honey. Thank you so much for getting those books for me. When the class reassembled, Matilda went to her desk and began to study a textbook on geometry. Miss Honey couldn't believe that the parents were totally unaware of their daughter's remarkable talents. Perhaps they would allow her to give private tuition to Matilda after school. She decided that she would go and call on Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood that very evening between 9 and 10 o'clock when Matilda was sure to be in bed. And that is precisely what she did. Yes? If you're selling raffle tickets, I don't want any. I am Matilda's teacher at school, and it is important that I have a word with you and your wife. Got into trouble already, is she? Oh. She's in no trouble at all. I have come with some good news about her. Do you think I might come in for a few minutes? We're right in the middle of watching one of our favourite programmes. This is most inconvenient. Mr Wormwood, if you think some rotten TV programme is more important than your daughter's future, then you ought not to be a parent. Oh. Oh, well, very well, then. 
Come on in and let's get it over with. Mrs. Wormwood isn't going to thank you for this. Who is it? Some school teacher. She says she's got to talk to us about Matilda. Don't turn off the sound. Willard is just about to propose to Angelica. You can still watch it while we talk. Get on with it then. I am sure that you know the children in the bottom class at school are not expected to be able to read or spell or juggle with numbers when they first arrive. But Matilda can do it all. And if I am to believe her... I wouldn't. Was she lying then when she told me that nobody taught her to multiply or to read? Did either of you teach her? Teach her what? To read books. Oh, we don't hold with book reading. You can't make a living from sitting on your fanny and reading storybooks. But does it not intrigue you that a little five-year-old is reading long adult novels by Dickens and Hemingway? Not particularly. Looks is more important than books, Miss Hunky. The name is Honey. Now, look at me. Then look at you. You chose books. I chose looks. And who's finished up the better off? Me, of course. I'm sitting pretty in a nice house with a successful businessman and you're left slaving away teaching a lot of nasty little children the ABC. Yeah, quite right, Sugar Plum. I haven't told you all of it yet. Matilda is also a kind of mathematical genius. She can multiply complicated figures in her head like lightning. Well, what's the point of that when you can buy a calculator? A girl doesn't get a man by being brainy. But don't you see... Matilda is so far ahead of everyone else that it might be worth thinking about some extra kind of private tuition. I seriously believe that she could be brought up to university standard in two or three years. Who wants to go to university, for heaven's sake? All they learn there is bad habits. Do not despise clever people, Mr Wormwood. But I see we're not going to agree. I'm sorry I burst in on you like this. Well, good of you to come, Miss Hawkes. Or is it Miss Harris? It's neither. But let it go. And away she went. The nice thing about Matilda was that she never showed off. It was therefore easy for her to make friends with other children. Among her newfound friends was the girl called Lavender. Lavender was exceptionally small for her age, but Matilda liked her because she was gutsy and adventurous. She liked Matilda for exactly the same reasons. On the third day, Matilda and Lavender were approached by a rugged ten-year-old with a boil on her nose called Hortensia. She was eating from an extra-large bag of potato crisps and digging the stuff out in handfuls. No scum, I suppose. Welcome to Borstal. Have you met the Trunchable yet? We've seen her at prayers. You've got a treat coming to you. She hates very small children. If you survive your first year, you may manage to survive the rest of your time here. I suppose you know the Trunchbull has a lock-up cupboard called the Chokey. It's a very tall but very narrow cupboard. You have to stand in it. And three of the walls are made of cement with bits of glass sticking out, so you can't lean against them. And the door's got thousands of sharp spiky nails sticking out of it. You have to stand at attention all the time. Have you ever been in there? My first term, I was in there six times. Why were you put in? What had you done? I can't remember all the things I did. It's all so long ago. Once I found the drawer where the trunchable kept her gym knickers and I sprinkled them with very powerful itching powder. Did it work? She must have thought she had a wasp nest in her knickers and there was no way she could know it was me that did it. But I got a day in the chokey just the same. Why? The Trunchable has a nasty habit of guessing. When she doesn't know who the culprit is, she makes a guess at it. She grabbed me by the ear and threw me inside the chokey and locked the door. I was spiked and cut all over when I came out. It's like a war. You're darn right, it's like a war. At this point, something strange happened. The playground, which up to then had been filled with shrieks of children at play, all at once became silent as the grave. Miss Trunchbull advanced through the crowd of boys and girls with menacing strides and approached a girl of ten who had a pair of plaited golden pigtails hanging over her shoulders. You, Amanda Thripp, 
I can't stand pigtails. Chop them off and throw them in the dustbin. My mummy thinks I look lovely, Miss Trunchbull. I don't give a tinker's toot what your mummy thinks. I'll give you pigtails, you little rat. Then Trunchbull grabbed Amanda's pigtails and lifted the girl clear off the ground. Then she started swinging her round and round her head faster and faster until suddenly she let go and Amanda went sailing like a rocket high up into the sky. Ah, not bad, considering I'm not in strict training. How does she get away with it, Matilda? Surely the children go home and tell their mothers and fathers. They wouldn't believe them. The stories would sound too ridiculous to be believed. And that is the Trunchbull's great secret. Never do anything by halves if you want to get away with it. They got an example of how dangerous the headmistress could be on the very next day. She called a special assembly of all 250 children and demanded that the boy, Bruce Bogtrotter, should come and stand before her. This clot, this foul carbuncle, this poisonous pustule is a thief. A crook, a pirate, a brigand, a rustler. Yesterday morning, during the break, you sneaked into the kitchen and stole a slice of my private chocolate cake. I, I never did. Don't lie to me, Bog Trotter. The cook saw you. You like my special cake, don't you, Bog Trotter? It's rich and delicious, isn't it, Bog Trotter? Very good. You're right. It is very good. Therefore, I think you should congratulate the cook. The cook was sent for, and Bog Trotter told her he thought her cake was very good. There you are, cook. Bog Trotter likes your cake. He adores your cake. Do you have any more of your cake you could give him? The cook disappeared. Almost at once she was back again, staggering under the weight of an enormous round chocolate cake. There you are, Bog Trotter. Now eat it! All of it! Eat! Greedy little thieves who like to eat cake must have cake! Eat faster, boy! If you stop before it's all finished, you'll go straight into the chokey and I shall lock the door and throw the key down the well. Do you think he can do it, Lavender? No, Matilda. He'd be sick before he's halfway through. But Bruce Bogtrotter kept on eating and a subtle change came over the watching children. Earlier on, they had sensed impending disaster. They had prepared themselves for an unpleasant scene in which the wretched boy would have to surrender and then they would have to watch the triumphant Trunchbull forcing more and more cake into the mouth of the gasping boy. Not a bit of it. He was slowing down, but he kept pushing the stuff into his mouth with the dogged perseverance of a long-distance runner who has sighted the finishing line and knows he must keep going. As the last mouthful disappeared, the children stood and cheered. The Trunchbull's great horsey face had turned the colour of molten lava and her eyes were glittering with fury. She grabbed the large empty plate on which the cake had rested and brought it down with a crash on the top of the wretched Bruce Bogtrotter's head. The boy was by now so full of cake he was like a sack of wet cement and you couldn't have hurt him with a sledgehammer. He simply shook his head and went on grinning. <coughs> In the middle of the first week of Matilda's first term, Miss Honey made an announcement. I have some important news for you, so listen carefully. You too, Matilda. Put that book down for a moment and pay attention. 
It is the headmistress's custom to take over the class for one period each week. She does this with every class in the school, and each class has a fixed day and a fixed time. Ours is always two o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, immediately after lunch. So tomorrow, Miss Trunchbull will be taking over from me for one lesson. I shall be here as well, but only as a silent witness. Is that understood? Yes, Miss Honey. I am quite sure that she will be testing you on what you are meant to have learnt this week. Try to remember everything you have learned. And one more thing: a jug of water and a glass must always be on the table here when the headmistress comes in. Now, who will be responsible for seeing that it is here? I will, Miss Honey. Very well, Lavender. It will be your job to go to the kitchen and get the jug and fill it with water. I won't forget. I promise I won't. Already, Lavender's scheming mind was going over the possibilities that this water jug job had opened up for her. She longed to do something truly heroic. She admired the older girl Hortensia to distraction for the daring deeds she had performed in the school. She also admired Matilda, who had sworn her to secrecy about the parrot job she had brought off at home, and also the great hair oil switch which had bleached her father's hair. It was her turn now to become a heroine. There was a muddy pond at the bottom of Lavender's garden, and this was the home of a colony of newts. That evening, she went down to the pond, determined to catch a newt. She lay on the bank a long time, waiting patiently until she spotted a whopper. Then, using her school hat as a net, she swooped and caught it. She put it into her pencil box, which she'd lined with pondweed, ready to receive it. And the next day, she carried her secret weapon to school in her satchel. Immediately after lunch, she dashed off to the kitchen and found one of the Trunchbull's famous jugs. She filled it half full of water and carried it, together with a glass, into the classroom, which was still empty. Quick as a flash. She took out her pencil box and tipped the newt into the water jug. The deed was done. At two o'clock sharp, the class assembled. Suddenly, in marched the gigantic figure of the headmistress in her belted smock and green breeches. Good afternoon, children. Good afternoon, Miss Trunchbull. Not a very pretty sight. What a bunch of nauseating little warts you are! It makes me vomit to think that I'm going to have to put up with a load of garbage like you in my school for the next six years. Stand up, everybody, and put your hands out in front of you. As I walk past, I want you to turn them over so I can see if they are clean on both sides. Yeah,、oh. not bad. They're all right. I suppose. You, what's your name? Nigel. Nigel, what? Nigel Hicks. Nigel Hicks, what? That's it. Unless you want my middle names as well. I do not want your middle names, you blister. What is my name? Miss Trunchbull. Then use it when you address me. What's your name? Nigel Hicks, Miss Trunchbull. That's better. Your hands are filthy, Nigel. When did you last wash them? Could have been yesterday, or it could have been the day before. I knew it. I knew as soon as I saw you that you were nothing but a piece of filth. What is your father's job? A sewage worker? He's a doctor. He says we're also covered with bugs anyway. That a bit of extra dirt never hurts anyone. You are disgusting. I don't want to see any more of you today. Go and stand in the corner on one leg with your face to the wall. I shall now test the class on the multiplication tables to see if Miss Honey has taught you anything at all in that direction. You, what's your name? Rupert, Miss Trunchbull. What is two sevens? Sixteen. Really? No, they're eighteen. Two sevens are eighteen, not sixteen. You ignorant little slug! You witless weed! You empty-headed hamster! You stupid glob of glue! 
Miss Trunchbull grabbed all the hair on Rupert's head in her fist and lifted the helpless boy clean out of his chair and held him aloft. I don't like pigtails and I don't like little boys with long hair. Two sevens are fourteen. I'm not letting you go until you say it. Miss Trunchbull, please let him down. All his hair might come out. And well it might, Miss Honey, if he doesn't stop wriggling. Now then, say it. Say two sevens are fourteen. And true to her word, Miss Trunchbull opened her hand and quite literally let Rupert go. He was a long way off the ground, and he plummeted to earth and hit the floor and bounced like a football. Help! Get up and stop whimpering. I don't like small people. I cannot for the life of me see why children have to take so long to grow up. I think they do it on purpose. But surely you were a small person once, Miss Trunchbull. I was never a small person. But surely you must have started out as a baby. Me? A baby? How dare you suggest such a thing? What infernal incense! What is your name, boy? My name is Eric Ink, Miss Trunchbull. Don't be an ass, boy. There is no such name. Look in the phone book. You'll see my father there under ink. You may be ink, young man, but let me tell you something. You're not indelible. I shall very soon rub you out if you try getting clever with me. Spell what? W-O-T. I'll give you one more chance. Oh, yes. I know. It's got a H in it. W-H-O-T. You are wrong, you poisonous little pockmark. You sit wrong, you look wrong, you speak wrong. You are wrong all round. Spell what? It's not W-O-T and it's not W-H-O-T. It's... it must be... W-H-O-T-T Ow! Let go of my ears! You're hurting me! Ow! Let go of my ears! I Ow, haven't me. started Ow, yet! Oh, Mr. Trunchbull, Ow, don't! Go. Please Ow, don't lift him up my ears! Ow, they might come off! They'll Ow, never come off! Ow, I have discovered through long experience, Ow, Miss Honey, that the ears of small boys stick very firmly to their heads. They stretch most marvellously, like these are doing now. But I can assure you Ow! they never come off. Ow! The word, what is spelled W-H-A-T? Now spell it, you little what. W-H-A-T! Now you can sit down again. That's the way to make them learn, Miss Honey. It's no good just telling them. You've got to hammer it into them. You could do them permanent damage, Miss Trunchbull. Oh, do shut up, Miss Honey. You're as wet as any of them. When you have been teaching for as long as I have, you'll realise that it's no good at all being kind to children. Read Nicholas Nickleby, Miss Honey. By Mr. Dickens, read about Mr. Wackford Squeers, that admirable headmaster of Do the Boys Hall. He knew how to handle the little brutes, didn't he? He knew how to use the birch, didn't he? He kept their backside so warm you could have fried eggs and bacon on them. A fine book, that. But I don't suppose this bunch of morons we've got here will ever read it. I've read it, Miss Trunchbull. Read what? Nicholas Nickleby, Miss Trunchbull. You're lying to me, madam. I doubt there is a single child in the entire school who has read that book. And here are you, an unhatched shrimp, sitting in the lowest form there is, trying to tell me a whopping great lie like that. Do you take me for a fool, child? Well, um... Stand up when you speak to me. What is your name? My name is Matilda Wormwood, Miss Trunchbull. Wormwood, is it? 
In that case, you must be the daughter of that man who owns Wormwood Motors. Yes, Miss Trunchbull. A week ago, he sold me a second-hand car that he said was almost new. I thought he was a splendid fellow, but this morning... Whilst I was driving the car through the village, the entire engine fell out onto the road. The man's a thief and a robber. I'll have his skin for sausages. You see if I don't. He's clever at his business. Clever, my foot. Miss Honey tells me that you are meant to be clever, too. Well, madam, I don't like clever people. They are all crooked. You are most certainly crooked. Before I fell out with your father, he told me some very nasty stories about the way you behaved at home. I shall be keeping a very careful eye on you from now on. Sit down and keep quiet. I have never been able to understand why small children are so disgusting. They should be got rid of as early as possible. We get rid of flies with fly spray and by hanging up fly paper. I have often thought of inventing a spray for getting rid of small children. Or better still, some huge strips of sticky paper. I would hang them all around the school and you'd all get stuck to them and that would be the end of it. Wouldn't that be a good idea, Miss Honey? If it's meant to be a joke, Headmistress, I don't think it's a very funny one. You wouldn't, would you, Miss Honey? And it is not meant to be a joke. My idea of a perfect school, Miss Honey, is one that has no children in it. No children at all. One of these days I shall start up a school like that. Ah, I see you've remembered my jug of water. Oh, I feel in the need of a little refreshment. The Trunchbull poured some water into her glass, and suddenly, with the water, out came the long, slimy newt straight into the glass. Ah, what is it? Oh, it's disgusting. It's a snake. It's a baby crocodile. It's an alligator. Matilda, stand up! Who, me? What have I done? Stand up, you disgusting little cockroach! I haven't done anything, Miss Trunchbull. Honestly, I haven't. I've never seen that slimy thing before. Stand up at once, you filthy little maggot! You are vile, repulsive, repellent, a malicious little brute! You are not fit to be in this school. You ought to be behind bars. I did not do it. Oh, yes, you did. Nobody else could have thought up a trick like that. Your father was right to warn me about you. You're finished in this school, young lady. You are finished everywhere. I shall personally see to it that you are put away in a place where not even the crows can land their droppings on you. You will probably never see the light of day again. I'm telling you, I did not do it. I've never even seen a creature like that in my life. You have put a... a, a crocodile in my drinking water. There is no worse crime in the world against a headmistress. Now sit down and don't say another word. But I'm telling you. I am telling you to shut up. If you don't shut up at once and sit down, I shall remove my belt and let you have it with the end that has the buckle. Slowly, Matilda sat down. Oh, the rottenness of it all. The unfairness. How dare they expel her for something she hasn't done? Matilda felt herself getting angrier and angrier and angrier, so unbearably angry that something was bound to explode inside her head very soon. She glared at the glass with the newt in it. She longed to march up and grab the glass and tip the contents, newt and all, over the trunchbull's head. And now, quite slowly, there began to creep over Matilda a most extraordinary and peculiar feeling. The feeling was mostly in the eyes. A kind of electricity seemed to be gathering inside them. A sense of power was brewing in those eyes of hers. Little waves of lightning seemed to be flashing out of her eyes. It was an amazing sensation. She kept her eyes steadily on the glass. 
And now the power was concentrating itself in one small part of each eye and growing stronger and stronger. And it felt as though millions of tiny little invisible arms with hands on them were shooting out of her eyes towards the glass she was staring at. Tip it. Tip it over. She saw the glass wobble. She kept pushing at it with all those millions of invisible little arms and hands that were reaching out from her eyes, feeling the power that was flashing straight from the two little black dots in the very centers of her eyeballs. Tip it. Tip it over. Once more, the glass wobbled. She pushed harder still, willing her eyes to shoot out more power. And then, very, very slowly, the glass began to lean backwards until it was balancing on just one edge of its base. And there it teetered for a few seconds before finally toppling over and falling with a sharp tinkle onto the desktop. The water in it and the squirming newt splashed out all over Miss Trunchbull's enormous bosom. Ah! Who did it? Come on, own up, step forward. You won't escape this time. Who is responsible for this dirty job? Who pushed over this glass? Matilda, it was you. I know it was you. Speak up, you clotted carbuncle. Admit that you did it. I have not moved away from my desk, Miss Trunchbull, since the lesson began. I can say no more. She didn't move. Matilda didn't move. Nobody moved. You must have knocked it over yourself. I most certainly did not knock it over myself. Speak up, Miss Honey. You must have seen everything. Who knocked over my glass? None of the children did, Miss Trunchbull. I'm telling you the truth, Headmistress. You must have knocked it over without knowing it. I am fed up with you useless bunch of midgets. I refuse to waste any more of my precious time in here. <sighs> I think we've had enough school for one day, don't you? You may all go out into the playground and wait for your parents to come and take you home. <laughs> Matilda did not join the rush to get out of the classroom. After the other children had all disappeared, she remained at her desk, quiet and thoughtful. She knew she had to tell somebody about what had happened with the glass. What she needed was just one wise and sympathetic grown-up who could help her to understand the meaning of this extraordinary happening. Neither her father or mother would be any use at all. On the spur of the moment, Matilda decided that the one person she would like to confide in was Miss Honey. Please may I talk to you for a moment? Of course you may. What's troubling you? Something very peculiar has happened to me, Miss Honey. Yes, Matilda. Tell me what has happened to you that is so peculiar. Miss Trunchbull isn't going to expel me, is she? Because it wasn't me who put the creature in her jug of water. I know it wasn't. Am I going to be expelled? I think not. The headmistress simply got a little overexcited, that's all. Good. But that isn't what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about the glass of water with the creature in it. You saw it spilling all over Miss Trunchbull, didn't you? I did indeed. Well, Miss Honey, I didn't touch it. I never went near it. But it was me. I don't quite understand what you mean. I did it with my eyes. Some sort of power came out of them and the glass just toppled over. Do you mean you actually willed the glass to tip over? Yes, with my eyes. If you did that, then it is just about the greatest miracle a person has ever performed since the time of Jesus. I did it, Miss Honey. Could you do it again? I don't know. I think I might be able to. Very well, then. Go ahead and tip it over. It might take some time. Take all the time you want. I'm in no hurry. It is extraordinary, thought Miss Honey, how often small children have flights of fancy like this. Matilda sat ten feet away at her desk, cupped her face in her hands, and this time she gave the order right at the beginning. Tip, glass, tip. But her lips didn't move, and she made no sound. Once again, but much more quickly this time, she felt the electricity gathering and the power beginning to surge. She saw the glass wobble, 
then it tilted, then it toppled right over and fell with a tinkle on the tabletop not twelve inches from Miss Honey's folded arms. Oh, Matilda, it's not possible. I, I don't believe it. I simply don't believe it. Would you like to come back and have tea in my cottage? Oh, I'd love to. You won't tell anyone about this... This thing that I did, will you, Miss Honey? I wouldn't dream of it, Matilda. Miss Honey and Matilda walked in silence through the village and onto a country road where there were no people anymore and very few motor cars. And now they were alone. Oh, Miss Honey, I do honestly feel I could move almost anything in the world, not just tipping over glasses and little things like that. I feel I could topple tables and chairs, Miss Honey, even when people are sitting in the chairs. I think I could push them over, and bigger things too, much bigger things than chairs and tables. Calm yourself down, child, calm yourself down. But you do think it is interesting, don't you, Miss Honey? Oh, I think it is interesting, all right. We are dealing with the unknown. The right word for it is a phenomenon. Am I a phenomenon? It is quite possible that you are. Miss Honey, wishing to change the subject for the moment, gave Matilda the names of all the trees and bushes that they passed and taught her how to recognize them by the shape of their leaves and the pattern of the bark on their trunks. They came at last to a narrow lane that was no more than a rutted cart track which led them to a small green gate almost hidden by the overhanging hazel branches. There it is. This is where I live. The cottage was so small, it looked more like a doll's house than a human dwelling. The kitchen was not much bigger than a good-sized clothes cupboard. There were no taps over the sink, and the only heating was a paraffin primer stove. Miss Honey sent Matilda to fetch water from the well, which she heated on the stove and made tea. Then she found a small brown loaf and cut two slices, which she spread with margarine, and took their meal into the sitting room to eat. The room was as small and square and bare as a prison cell. The only objects in the entire room were two upturned wooden boxes to serve as chairs and a third box between them for a table. Matilda was appalled. Was this really where her neat and trimly dressed schoolteacher lived? There was something very strange going on around here, surely. Sit down, my dear, sit down. And we'll have a nice hot cup of tea. Help yourself to bread. Both slices are for you. I never eat anything when I get home. You know, I've been thinking about what you did with that glass. The fascinating thing would be to find out the real limit of this power of yours. I'd love to try something really huge. We mustn't hurry this, so let's have another cup of tea. And do eat that other slice of bread. You must be hungry. Miss Honey, do they pay you very badly at our school? Not too badly. I get about the same as the others. Do all the teachers live like this, with no furniture and no kitchen stove and no bathroom? No, they don't. I just happen to be the exception. I'm very sorry I asked you all those questions, Miss Honey. It is not any of my business. Why shouldn't you ask? You are much too bright not to have wondered. Perhaps I even wanted you to ask. As a matter of fact, you are the first visitor to come to the cottage since I moved in two years ago. May I tell you a story? Of course. I am 23 years old, and when I was born, my father was a doctor in this village. We had a nice old house, quite large, red brick. My mother died when I was two. My father, a busy doctor, had to have someone to run the house and look after me. So he invited my mother's unmarried sister, my aunt, to come and live with us. I hated her right from the start. I missed my mother terribly, and the aunt was not a kind person. My father didn't know that because he was hardly ever around, but when he did put in an appearance, the aunt behaved differently. 
I can't think why I'm telling you all this. Go on, please. Well, then came the second tragedy. When I was five, my father died very suddenly. My aunt became my legal guardian. And in some way or other, she became the actual owner of the house. How did your father die? It is interesting you should ask that. You see, no one could believe that he would ever have done it. He was such a very sane and sensible man. Done what? Killed himself. Did he? That's what it looked like. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking the aunt killed him and made it look like he'd done it himself. Well, one must never think things like that without proof. What happened when you were left all alone with the aunt? She was a demon. My life was a nightmare. What did she do to you? Oh, I don't want to talk about it. It's too horrible. But in the end, I became so frightened of her, I used to start shaking when she came into the room. Didn't you have any other relations? None that I knew about. And that's still the way it is now, I'm afraid. You must have gone to school. Of course. I went to the same school you're going to now. But I lived at home. And by the time I was ten, I had become my aunt's slave. I did all the housework. I made her bed. I washed and ironed for her. I did all the cooking. I was her slave. What happened when you left school? I was a bright pupil. I could easily have gone into university, but I was needed at home to do the work. Then how did you become a teacher? There is a teacher's training college in Reading. I was allowed to go there on the condition I came straight home every afternoon to do the washing and ironing and to clean the house and cook the supper. How did you manage to get away from her in the end and come and live in this funny little house? Ah, that was something. I was proud of that. When I got my teacher's job, the aunt told me I owed her a lot of money because of all the food and clothes she'd bought me over the years. She told me it added up to thousands, and I had to pay her back by giving her my salary for the next ten years. She even arranged with the school authorities to have my salary paid directly into her own bank. She made me sign the paper. She gave me one pound a week pocket money. So how did you manage to escape? Ah, that was two years ago. It was my greatest triumph. I used to go for walks when my aunt was still asleep. I came across this tiny cottage. I found the farmer who owned it, and I went to see him. I asked him if I could rent his cottage. You can't live there, he cried. It's got no conveniences, no running water, no nothing. I said, I'm a romantic. I've fallen in love with it. You're mad, he said. But if you insist, you're welcome to it. The rent will be ten pence a week. Here's one month's rent in advance, I said, giving him 40p. And thank you very much. How super. But how did you pluck up the courage to tell the aunt? That was tough, but I steeled myself to do it. I was free at last. I can't tell you how wonderful it was. This awful aunt. I suppose she is still living in your lovely old house. Very much so. She's still only about 50. She'll be around for a long time yet. Do you think your father really meant her to own the house forever? I'm quite sure he didn't. My father's will was never found. It looks as though somebody destroyed it. No prizes for guessing who. But if there is no will, then surely the house goes automatically to you. You are the next of kin. I know I am. But my aunt produced a piece of paper supposedly written by my father saying that he leaves the house to his sister-in-law in return for her kindness in looking after me. I'm certain it's a forgery, but no one can prove it. Couldn't you hire a good lawyer and make a fight of it? I don't have the money to do that. And you must remember that this aunt of mine is a much respected figure in the community. She has a lot of influence. Who is she? Miss Trunchbull. Miss Trunchbull? You mean she is your aunt? She brought you up? Yes. No wonder you were terrified. The other day we saw her grab a girl by the pigtails and throw her over the playground fence. You haven't seen anything. After my father died when I was five and a half, she used to make me bath myself all alone. 
and if she came up and thought I hadn't washed properly, she'd push my head under the water and hold it there. But don't get me started on what she used to do. That won't help us at all. No, it won't. We came here to talk about you, and I've talked about nothing but myself the whole time. I am much more interested in what you can do with those amazing eyes of yours. I can move things. I know I can. How would you like it if we made some cautious experiments to see just how much you can move and push? If you don't mind, Miss Honey, I think I would rather not. I want to go home now and think about all the things I've heard this afternoon. The two of them walked all the way to Matilda's house without saying a word. But when they reached the gate, Miss Honey broke the silence. You had better forget everything I told you this afternoon. I won't promise to do that, but I will promise not to talk about it to anyone anymore, not even you. I think that would be wise. I won't promise to stop thinking about it, though, Miss Honey. I believe I've got just a tiny little bit of an idea. Oh, you mustn't. Oh, please forget it. I would like to ask you three last things before I stop talking about it. Please, will you answer them, Miss Honey? Well, that depends on what the questions are. The first thing is this. What did Miss Trunchbull call your father when they were around in the house at home? I'm sure she called him Madness. That was his first name. And what did your father call Miss Trunchbull? Her name is Agatha. That's what he would have called her. And lastly, what did your father and Miss Trunchbull call you around the house? They called me Jenny. Thank you. And now I won't mention the subject any more. Goodbye, Miss Honey. Thank you so much for the tea. Matilda found the house empty as usual. She went straight into the living room and opened the drawer of the sideboard where she knew her father kept a box of cigars. She took one out and carried it up to her bedroom and shut herself in. Now for the practice. It's going to be tough, but I'm determined to do it. Her plan for helping Miss Honey was beginning to form beautifully in her mind. It all depended on her being able to do one very special thing with her eye power. The cigar was essential. It was perhaps a bit thicker than she would have liked, but the weight was about right. It would be fine for practicing with. She cleared her dressing table and laid the cigar down in the middle of it. Then she walked away and sat on the end of her bed. She was now about ten feet from the cigar. She began to concentrate, and very quickly this time, she felt the electricity beginning to flow inside her head, and millions of tiny invisible hands began pushing like sparks towards the cigar. Almost at once, the cigar rolled across the top of the dressing table and fell onto the carpet. She picked it up and put it back on the dressing table. Now for the difficult one. But if I have the power to push, then surely I also have the power to lift. It is vital I learn how to lift it. I must learn how to lift it right up into the air and keep it there. Lift, lift, lift. One end of the cigar slowly lifted up about an inch off the table. With a colossal effort of concentration, she managed to hold it there for about ten seconds. Then it fell back again. I'm getting it. I'm starting to do it. For the next hour, Matilda kept practicing. And in the end, she had managed, by the sheer power of her eyes, to lift the whole cigar clear off the table about six inches into the air and hold it there for about a minute. Then suddenly she was so exhausted she fell back on the bed and went to sleep. From then on, every day after school, Matilda shut herself in her room and practiced with the cigar. Six days later, she was able not only to lift the cigar up into the air, but also to move it around exactly as she wished. It's beautiful. I can really do it now. All I have to do is put my great plan into action. The next day was Thursday, and that, as Miss Honey reminded her class, 
was the day on which the headmistress would take charge of the first lesson after lunch. One or two of you did not particularly enjoy the last occasion when the headmistress took the class. So let us all try to be especially careful and clever today. How are your ears, Eric, after your last encounter with Miss Trunchbull? She stretched them. My mother's positive that they are much bigger than they were. Oh, it's not noticeable. Rupert, I am glad to see you didn't lose any of your hair after last Thursday. My hair was jolly sore afterwards. Oh, I'm sure it was. And you, Nigel, do please try not to be a smart aleck with the headmistress today. You were really quite cheeky to her last week. I hate her. Try not to make it so obvious. It doesn't pay. She's a very strong woman. I wish I was grown up. I'll knock her flat. I doubt you would. No one has ever got the better of her yet. After lunch, the class reassembled, and then, like some giant of doom, the enormous trunchbull strode into the room. I'm glad to see there are no slimy creatures in my drinking water this time. If there had been, then something exceptionally unpleasant would have happened to every single member of this class. And that includes you, Miss Honey. Now... Let's see how badly Miss Honey has taught you the three times table. You, what's your name? Wilfred Miss Trunchbull. Recite the three times table backwards. Backwards? But I haven't learnt it backwards. There you are, she's taught you nothing. Miss Honey, why have you taught them absolutely nothing at all in the last week? But well, that is not true, Headmistress. They have all learnt their three times table. But I see no point in teaching it to them backwards. Don't you get impertinent with me, Miss Honey. Very well, boy. Answer me this. I have seven apples, seven oranges, and seven bananas. How many pieces of fruit do I have all together? Hurry up! That's sad enough. That isn't three times table. You blithering idiot. You festering gun boil. You, 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 you flea-bitten fungus. This is the three times table. Three sevens are twenty-one. Can't you see that, you stagnant cesspool? I'll give you one more chance. I have eight coconuts, eight monkey nuts, and eight nutty little idiots like you. How many nuts do I have all together? Answer me quickly. Please, why I go add up eight coconuts? You bursting blister. You moth-eaten maggot. This is not adding up. This is multiplication. In two strides, the trunchbull was beside Wilfred. She flipped the back of his legs with one of her feet so that the boy shot up off the ground and turned a somersault in the air. But halfway through the somersault, she caught him by the ankle and held him dangling upside down like a plucked chicken in a shop window. Ow! Ow! At exactly that moment, Nigel, at the other end of the room, jumped to his feet and pointed excitedly at the blackboard. The chalk! The chalk! Look at the chalk! It's moving all on its own! It's writing something! The chalk is writing something! Wonder please, this is this! He's written my name, Agatha. Who's doing this? Who's writing it? The chalk continued to write. It wrote, Agatha, this is Magnus. This is Magnus. No, it can't be. It can't be Magnus. But the chalk wrote on. It is Magnus, and you'd better believe it. Miss Honey glanced swiftly at Matilda, whose eyes were glittering like two stars. And still the chalk wrote on, Agatha, give my Jenny back her house. Give my Jenny her wages. Give my Jenny the house, then get out of here. If you don't, I will come and get you. I will come and get you like you got me. I am watching you, Agatha. The chalk stopped writing. It hovered for a few seconds, then suddenly it dropped to the floor and broke in two. Miss Trunchbull's face had turned white as snow, and her mouth was opening and shutting like a halibut out of water. And then she fell to the floor with a great thump. She's painted. She's out cold. Someone go and fetch a mater at once. My father says cold water is the best way to wake up someone who's fainted. I'll use the water in her jug. 
Not even Miss Honey protested as Nigel poured the entire contents of the jug over the Trunchbull's head. It took all the school's five teachers and the matron to lift the enormous woman and stagger with her out of the classroom. Children, I think you'd all better go out into the playground and amuse yourselves until the next lesson. The children filed out and Matilda started to go with them but as she passed Miss Honey, she paused and her twinkling eyes met the teacher's eyes and Miss Honey ran forward and gave the tiny child a great big hug and a kiss. The next morning, Miss Trunchbull did not turn up at the school and all her things were missing. The headmistress had apparently vanished. On the second morning, Miss Honey received a letter from a firm of solicitors informing her that the last will and testament of her late father had suddenly and mysteriously turned up and that Miss Honey was the rightful owner of the red brick house. The will also showed that her father's lifetime savings, which fortunately were still safely in the bank, had also been left to her. Back at school, Mr. Trilby was appointed head teacher in place of Miss Trunchbull, and Matilda was moved up into the top form. A few weeks later, she was having tea with Miss Honey, who was now living in her proper home. Something strange has happened to me, Miss Honey. Tell me about it. This morning, I tried to push something over with my eyes, and I couldn't do it. The power has gone. I think I've lost it completely. I was expecting something like that to happen. Now that you're in the top class, all your mental energy is being used up. I'm glad it's happened. I wouldn't want to go through life as a miracle worker. You've done enough. I can still hardly believe you made all this happen. Matilda and Miss Honey talked for an hour or so, and then at about six o'clock, Matilda went to her parents' house, which was only about an eight-minute journey away. Less than half an hour later, Miss Honey was pruning her roses when she was surprised to see Matilda running back up the gravel drive. My, my, what in the world is the matter? They're leaving. They've all gone mad. And they're filling their suitcases. And they're leaving for Spain in about 30 minutes. Who is? Mummy and Daddy and my brother Mike. And they say I've got to go with them. You mean for a holiday? Forever. Daddy said we were never coming back. Actually, I'm not very surprised. Why? Please tell me why. Because your father is in with a bunch of crooks. And now somebody probably tipped him off that the police are onto him and he's doing what they all do, running off to Spain where they can't get him. I don't want to go with them. I'm afraid you must. I want to live here with you. I only wish you could, but you cannot leave your parents just because you want to. But what if they agreed? Would you let me stay with you then? Yes, that would be heaven. I think they might. They don't actually care tuppence about me. Please come with me and ask them. But we'll have to hurry. We'll have to run. And run they did. They found the Wormwoods piling suitcases into their car. Matilda pleaded with her parents to be allowed to stay behind with Miss Honey. And her teacher backed her up. I would love to have Matilda. I would look after her with loving care, Mr Wormwood. And I would pay for everything. She wouldn't cost you a penny. But it was not my idea. It was Matilda's, and I will not agree to take her without your full and willing consent. I'm in a hurry. I've got a plane to catch. If she wants to stay, let her stay. It's fine with me. <laughs> Matilda leapt into Miss Honey's arms and hugged her, and Miss Honey hugged her back. The brother gave a wave through the rear window of the car as the Wormwoods drove away, but the parents did not even look back. Miss Honey was still hugging the tiny girl, and neither said a word as they watched the car tearing round the corner at the end of the road and disappearing forever into the distance. Mm -hmm.